And now, it's time for another Dice Tower Review with Tom Vassell. No, no, I'm not going to throw this game off the roof. But if you've watched any of my reviews, you know my opinion of games where the person on the front of the box looks like they are having the most miserable of days. And this is supposed to enthuse me about playing this. Everyone always makes fun of those old pictures and uh, advertisements of kids playing a game and they're going, <sighs> Uh, but this is not the answer to that. Now, Hans and Teutonica is a game that's about trading or establishing a network in cities in the, in the medieval age. Boring. And honestly, it took me a long time to even play the game because it just looked boring. However, however, this is actually a very well-designed game. There's really neat mechanics, especially in its machinery building. And had this game a good theme, I would be hailing it from the hills to high after. But as it is, the theme doesn't really make sense, doesn't match up with the mechanics at all. But the mechanics work well enough that I will play this game if you ask me to, but I won't usually introduce it to people just because, well, it doesn't seem very interesting. It is! Doesn't seem like it is, though. Okay, I'll try not to talk about the theme much more. Let's talk now about the mechanics. All right, the game revolves around the board that you have in front of you, and this is really a, a neat aspect of the game. If you notice, on that board is a pile of your pieces. You actually start with pieces, depending on how many players are in the game. I start with eight traders and one merchant, because, you know, the different... Okay, never mind. Anyway, the, I start with these pieces. I also have three pieces that, I, that are in the reserve. I can get those later. But as the game progresses, there will be times where I'll be able to take these off the board, which will give me some extra abilities, but also gives me another trader to work with. Or if I pull these off, I get more merchants. So what do these do? Well, each of these tracks has something different. Say, for example, over here. In here, this is where I have privileges. Right now, I can build in white cities. But if I can manage to remove this cube, I can now build in white or orange. And then white, orange, or pink. And then white, orange, pink, or black. Over here at the top are points at the end of the game. Here I get one point for every city in a connect network. There are two points, still two points, now three points, and now four points. Over here, this one's critical. How many actions do I get per turn? I start with two actions, but I can get three, still at three, then get four, still at four, and then get five actions. Over here, when I'm taking cubes from reserve, pulling cubes from over here into my pile, I can take three as one action. Here I can take five, here I can take seven, or for the last one I can take as many cubes as there are in reserve. And then in the middle, how many cubes can I place in the board for one action? Here I can place two, here I can place three, four, and five. So as the game progresses now, I don't know that anyone's ever going to open up their entire board like I just did. But as you do that, you get more special abilities in a sense where you can have more actions and you have to decide as the game progresses. Here's the board. and. Each turn, a player will get certain many actions, as opposed as, as mentioned on your player board. For an action, you can place one of your traders or one of your merchants on one of the free spots on the board. I mentioned earlier that you can place multiple. That that's not the point. That was incorrect. You can actually move more trader. You can move them from different locations to other places, depending on again what you have on the board. What you're trying to do is you are trying to fill up a trading route between two different cities. When you do this, you have completed the trading route, you take all of them off, put them in reserve, and then you can place one in one of the open cities that's next to that route as long as you have the privilege to build in that color. From then on, any time a route is connected to that city is completed, each player who has one of these Hansas here in that city will get one point. So that's one way to get points during the course of the game. Now, when you complete a trade route between cities, you can build in one of the cities. Or, if you build between two special cities, like for example up here, if I build between these two cities, rather than put something in one of these two cities, I can instead take one of my merchants off the board. There's different spots on the place where you can basically upgrade your technology. That's the best way to describe it. Uh, by building between different cities, you can upgrade your actions, or you can upgrade different, you know, how many cubes you can move on the board. And there's different ways to do that. Over here, between these two cities, if you do that, if you build between them, you can instead place a cube up here, which will give you extra points at the end of the game. And some cities, when you put 
a cube in that city, you can see, for example, this white one, it gives you a point straight out. If that wasn't enough, the game starts with bonus tiles that will be placed between some cities, like for example up here. If I finish the route that's between those cities, I get that bonus tile. Not only is that bonus tile worth points at the end of the game, but I will also be able to use it for a special action. Like this one allows me to place a cube in a city even if there's not room for it any longer. And so that's basically how the game progresses. It will continue on until some cities are filled up. Up here we, we're going to use a black cube to keep track of how many cities are filled up. And once 10 cities have been completely filled up, then the game ends. And then everyone will count up their final points, uh, which is quite a bit. Or if one player reaches 20 points on the scoring track, you can get many more than 20 at the game end. But once someone reaches 20 during the game, then the game ends and we add up points. You're going to get points for skills that you've increased to the maximum on your little player board. You also get points equal to however many bonus markers you have. You'll get points, uh, as I mentioned, on the board over here. And then you'll get points for any connected network of cities you have. So, for example, if I have someone in four different connected cities, I then look at my board and I'll say, hey, man, I get four points for each city. So that would give me 16 extra points. And then whoever has... Whoever controls the city gets two points. There's lots of different ways to score in this game, and it's really an open-ended game of being able to put things wherever you want. And anyway, the player with the most points is the winner. Hatsune Chitanica is a very open-ended game. There's room to do whatever you want. You can sit there and say, man, I want to put this cube on the board, but where? There's so many places to put it. There's rules about displacing someone else's cube, which costs an extra cube, but sometimes you just need to do it. However, when you do that, they will get an extra cube on the board themselves. And it, it's very interesting because you sit there and say, well, I want to upgrade my technology, but at the same time, if I spend too many times doing that, I'm not going to control any of these cities on the board. And you need to control cities on the board to get points at the end of the game. And so there's just really a lot to do. So, like I said, I found this game very fascinating, but this absolutely dreadfully boring board combined with a boring thing. I mean, with this upgrading stuff, why couldn't it be a factory where you're upgrading different machinery to be able to do different things? I, okay, I'm, I'm done whining about the thing, but I enjoyed it quite a bit. As I said, because it's so open-ended, some players are going to sit there and be overwhelmed at the amount of choices they have. But to me, what makes the game are these player boards able to make your own decisions and, you know, move the different cubes around. So, yes, I'll gladly play it if you ask me to, and I will try a different strategy every time because I think there's probably 20, 30 different things that you can, different ways that you can try to win. Uh, and, wow, this player board looks pretty cool. It looks like a table. This is neat. Um, even he likes the game. He's just not showing it. Thanks for joining us today. For more written, audio, and video reviews, as well as the number one board game podcast, check out the website at www.thedicetower.com. Until then, this is Eric Summerer, and you've been watching The Dice Tower.